Hello, I'm Scott Jackson. I am the Mary Irene Ryan Executive Director of Shakespeare at Notre Dame, as well as one of the co-founders of the Shakespeare in Prisons Network. Uh, thanks for joining us today. We're honored to have with us three drama therapist practitioners from the Marin Shakespeare Company and their Shakespeare and Social Justice programs. My pleasure to introduce Marianne Shine, Lynn Baker Nauman, and Soraya Keating. Uh, so I'm going to hand this over to Soraya. So take us away and tell us all about approaches to drama therapy. Thank you so much for having us, Scott. It's a pleasure to be here. So we're just gonna do a little, little self intro. So I'm Soraya Keating and I work as uh, the Shakespeare for Social Justice Director for Marin Shakespeare Company. I've been working with the Marin Shakespeare Prison Program since 2005, where I started in San Quentin State Prison. I've also worked at California Medical Facility uh, a little bit at Solano Prison with Lynn and uh, also direct the Return Citizens Theater Troupe, which is a group of artists who were formerly incarcerated creating theater with Marin Shakespeare Company. And just want to share a, a, something that's touched me about the work uh, that we've been doing. Many things have touched me, but one in particular is seeing how many cross-racial, cross-ethnic, cross-diversity friendships have been formed in the groups we facilitate where people come together in ways that they probably wouldn't have if not for groups like ours. So that's, that's one thing I wanna share. Mm -hmm. And I'll pass it uh, to you, Marianne. Hi, I'm Marianne Shine. I too am a drama therapist and I went to school with Lynn um, at California Institute of Integral Studies, or CIIS. And I started working with Soraya in 2014 um, at San Quentin Prison. I also have experience working um, at Langley Porter Psych Hospital and also with hospice. And I have my own private practice as a drama therapist. Um, and one of the things I am most touched by doing the prison work is this thing that I call the moment of liftoff where uh, we're engaged, we're in a circle, we're doing some scene or we're doing some game or some activities taking place. And all of a sudden, it's as if the walls of the prison fall away. We are no longer confined um, by the limitations of being in this space and we're having fun and it becomes exciting. And my hands are literally off the steering wheel and the room is just taking off and playing and having a great time. And I'm just in that moment of noticing like, here we go, this is it. And the room has just come alive with joy and spontaneity. And I just love it. It lifts off into this wonderful, magical play space. And Lynn. Yeah, that's great. Hi, I'm Lynn Baker Nauman. And I've been working with Marin Shakespeare since 2014. As Marianne mentioned, we were both volunteers at San Quentin with Soraya and Leslie Courier. Uh, and then I was fortunate enough to work with Leslie starting a program at Solano State Prison. And then after that, uh, opening, a prison, uh, opening a program at Folsom Women's Facility and Old Folsom and California Healthcare Facility in Stockton. So it's been a, a great ride. And one thing that really touches me about this work is the resilience that we get to witness. We know that there's been so much trauma and so much in, intense, like, trauma and different things that they've gone through. So to see them wholeheartedly dive into something new and to deal with feelings and to deal with sometimes the scary topic of Shakespeare, right? Of something different, something new and to see them go through that process of, of letting that go and diving in. But I also wanted to share a favorite moment because actually it's many moments, but it's that spontaneous improv moment of, of a dance party. I don't know if anyone else has experienced this, but we do a lot of sound and movement that is created from us. Our bodies are, are you know, stomping, clapping with our, you know, banging on our bodies, uh, their mouths, because we don't have instruments and we can't bring in a boom box. So, you know, making it with like banging on the tables and the chairs. And then next, you know, like this, maybe there's some vocalization too, but next, you know, like there's that movement that comes in and there's, there's a dance party happening and we're all in it. And there's this like celebration of joy that everyone is connecting. And those are my favorite moments. And I just, I miss those so much and wish I knew how to 
make those more <laughs> intentionally, but I love the spontaneity of it. Thank you, Lynn. I love those dance party moments too. And just love seeing how creativity comes through uh, regardless of the circumstances, how we, yeah, we're such creators. And when we give ourselves permission in that play space, dance parties or that moment of lift off as Marianne so beautifully uh, articulated. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's really special. So I wanna share a little bit about the landscape or the roadmap we have planned for you today. I, I also just wanna give a shout out for Leslie and Bob Career of Marin Shakespeare who started the Shakespeare in Prison program back in 2003. Such visionaries they are and uh, the whole team they've created to expand this program to 14 different prisons. Um, so today, what Marianne Lynn and I want to do is bring the, the lens of drama therapists. So something unique about the three of us is we are all uh, trained drama therapists. So, and, and so what does that mean in terms of prison work? It, uh, in, in our conversations, one thing it means is we're looking at the work we do, not as therapy, but with a therapeutic lens with the, the idea that theater can be healing depending on the way we hold it. So, um, so what we have in store for you is Marianne will in a moment lead us through a, a brief check-in drama therapy style, uh, although theater style too, there's a lot of overlap. And then we'll be talking about three concepts that we actively cultivate in our, in our groups that have a kind of therapeutic quality. Uh, the, the first is connection, which I'll be speaking about in a little more detail. The second is cultivating emotional awareness and emotional intelligence that Marianne will, will discuss. And the third that Lynn will discuss is uh, building empathy. And, uh, and I know Scott will be sprinkling in questions throughout and also playing with us as we lightly engage in a few sample activities, which we'll be doing more of in our workshop on February 26th. That'll be full on activities. But today we'll, we're focusing more on discussion and also sharing some sample video clips from our work. So that's what we got for you. And Marianne, would you like right. to leave a check in? So um, I'm going to give you an example and we're going to all participate right now. Um, a typical warm up when we are coming into class at um, an incarceral setting. Hi, class. How's everyone doing today? So um, let's take all that stuff that we had from the outside before coming in here and bundle it up in a ball because we don't want to carry any of that stuff in with us today. Yep, that's right. Take it off, right? Where all the, some of it's sticky, some of it's really attached like Velcro and really peel it off, ball it up. And then we're going to throw it out the door. We'll leave it by the door. You can pick it up on your way out. Ready? One, two, three. Ah, that way we can be fully present right here, right now, doing this beautiful work. We're each going to go around the room and do a check-in. And I will say my name. Except today I'm going to say it two different ways. I'm going to think of two emotions I had this past week, maybe contrasting emotions. And I will start saying my name in one of the emotions and then you will all reflect back to me what that sounds and looks like. And then I'll do the next motion and you'll reflect that back to me and we'll go on to the next person, okay? So I will go first to demonstrate how this works. Marianne. Marianne. Mary nice. All right, Lynn. Um, uh, Lynn. 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 I pass it to Scott. 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 
Scott. Oh, God. God. And I'll pass it to Soraya. Woo, thank you. Uh, uh, Soraya. Uh, Soraya. 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 Great. Beautifully done, everyone. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm going to. Excellent. Well, we wanted to share a little bit of that idea of, you know, we're doing this, imagining doing this with 25 plus participants in our sometimes small, small rooms. Um, but the fact that the energy keeps, keeps going and each time we do any of these warm ups and how important the warm ups are. Sometimes for a two hour class, we might do up to a half hour and checking in and seeing, you know, taking the room temperature, if you will, of, of what is needed, how much, um, and sometimes we do less, sometimes do more. It's all about the flexibility. But I wanted to share with you a clip we have from, uh, from Shakespeare in Blue, which is 2013 was when Soraya created this. And so you'll see a little bit of the actual work inside. And shake it out a bit. And I want to invite you to share through sound and movement three different ways how you're feeling right now. And we'll repeat it back. So I'll go first. Soraya! Everyone? Soraya! 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 And JW, how are you feeling? Sound and movement. JW! Oh, thanks for that, Lynn. Um, that's just a beautiful way to start a class to just connect on on that level. Um, so you you all talked about or are going to talk about the three important building blocks of your work, which are connection, emotional awareness, and empathy. So starting with connection, can you tell me why that's important? Thanks, Scott. Sure, um, I'd love to talk about connection. So, um, and, and we chose these three building blocks today because we wanted to consolidate. There, there are more, but for these three, we see as perhaps some of the most important in focusing on in our work. So, so connection, what's important about connection? Well, when, when you think about what's right with our world or what's right with relationships and what also what's wrong with our world and what's wrong with relationships or what's not helpful. Um, for me, it really has to do with how healthy or unhealthy our connections are. And we, we like to look at connection on different levels. Um, our connection to ourself. How can we cultivate healthy connections to ourself? So we like to focus on that in the the groups that we're running, healthy self-esteem, healthy awareness of our emotions, as Marianne will talk about, um, healthy awareness of our, of our gifts and also of our struggles. Uh, on another level, it's important to cultivate healthy connection to each other. So that's a really big focus of our work, it, especially in a prison environment where there's a, a lot of encouragement to stay armored and not vulnerable and not connect with people who are quote unquote different than us, you know, different races, different gang members, whatever the difference. So we're trying to, uh, to, to shift all that and actually through our structured activities, make sure people are interacting through mixing up different pairs activities, different games and pairs, different games and groups of three, groups of four, 
we're, we're cultivating a healthy sense of connection. Um, and also by the questions we ask, uh, the activities we do, but also the questions we ask. So as drama therapists, one favorite way of working is to blend in these sort of playful, creative activities with opportunities for self-reflection and self-sharing. And we'll model a little more of that um, in a bit. Um, now, just to, to stand back and take a meta view of connection, perhaps some of you are familiar with relational cultural theory, which was founded by um, it's kind of a movement uh, from feminist psychology, Jean Baker Miller and others um, <clears throat> put this theory forward. And the idea behind relational cultural theory is that there's only one disease in this world, and that's the disease of disconnection. So if you consider that as possibly true, uh, as, as I do, um, then what heals that is to bring back healthy connection. And so that's a big focus. Um, another simple way of putting that is if we look at relationships, um, we can say unhealthy relationships create unhealthy people, mm -hmm. whereas healthy relationships create healthy people. So big part of our work is really asking how can we cultivate that connection to self, to other, also to the larger community. You know, people who are incarcerated are often heavily um, stigmatized and labeled and misunderstood and not looked at, you know, I mean, more, lots is changing now. We're seeing the trauma and the oppression and the racism that creates mass incarceration. Um, but years ago, this was different. This is not happening. So creating a connection between people who are incarcerated and the community so that their voices are heard. That's another focus of ours. So, so we would love to share a, a clip of one of our long-term participants, Luke, who also goes by Julian. Um, and in this clip at the very end, he'll share a little bit about connection um, well, connection to what matters to him, connection to God and to the creative force. But we thought we'd, we'd share a little bit of voices from the inside. And then, and then after we come back together, I'll lead a brief exercise that demonstrates connection. So ready for the clip, hope you enjoy. Shakespeare has allowed me to uh, learn about relationships between people. Uh, I really respect these men in here, you know. I have uh, shared very tender moments with these people in here and it's because of Shakespeare. It was the most terrifying role that I've ever taken on <laughs> by far. I was having nightmares. I was waking up in a cell, bumping my head, flailing my arms. Did I get that line right, you know? One morning I woke up and I thought I'd missed the show. <laughs> um, I had just come off a of pneumonia, so I still have it, so. But uh, how was it for me? It was, um, wow. It was so fun. <laughs> I had a good time, the challenge not knowing if I could, if I could shed myself completely and become that role. Frailty, thy name is woman, a little month, oh, I see thee, even she, oh, oh God, a beast that wants the source of reason, would, would have more longer married with my uncle, my father's brother, but no more. No more like my woman eye to Hercules. I haven't climbed Mount Everest yet, but I will physically. And this has prepared me for that. I have not run, swam, or biked on any of the um, Ironmans in Hawaii, but this has prepared me for that. I can honestly say when I am blessed to have children like these men in here who do have children, that it has prepared me for those challenges in some aspects. 
It's made me a good listener, a better listener. It's allowed me to question myself and go into that cell and beat myself up, talk to myself in a shower amongst men and do Shakespeare, but naked in front of men who are going, why is he talking to himself in a shower? <laughs> because I am so involved in that play. Luke does not exist. He cannot exist because the truth of the moment, I have to end myself in order to be born into something else. So it was like creating a whole new universe. I wish we could have done it more than one time. I was at one of my, my stellar ballet classes at the boys club. And it went something like this. Plie, Julian. Yes, Mrs. Schlesinger. Grown plie, Julian. Yes, Mrs. Schlesinger. Back straight, shoulders back. Up, Julian. Yes, Mrs. Schlesinger. Oh, you're having such a wonderful time, aren't you, Julian? Yes, Mrs. Schlesinger. This is a type of program that should be transferred to other prisons, you know, so we as men and women who are in prison can learn to connect with that which we became disconnected from. And I see that has helped me in a lot of aspects. Uh, what it's given me is a, um, spiritually wise, you know, acting for me is, is it's, it's my connection to, to, to God, you know, in, in, in some, some aspects I feel, I feel this weird sense of energy, this weird sense of, of, of fulfillment of, you know, you can do wrong, but it's okay. It'll work out, just trust, you know. Faith and trust to me are not necessarily the same thing, so it's about trusting. And as a spiritual man, that, that uh, journey is so loving. I feel love, you know. Uh, even in prison, in here, this is the one place where I can come and feel, uh, and feel love. I can feel God's love. Oh, there's a little clip of, of Luke speaking of connection. And that video is made by David Wayne White, by the way. Um, Yeah, so just invite us to the audience too to just feel your connection to Luke or to whatever resonated or touched you in Luke's words. I know they touch me every time I watch that clip and every time I've been in Luke's presence. Um, there's a, yeah, there's a way in which, you know, through our theater work, we really invite in that, um, that spirit of love and support which, and being connected to that is also uh, incredibly valuable and incredibly healing because prisons are generally not places that promote love and support or have not traditionally been that. So everyone, here's a very brief exercise to demonstrate uh, something we might do in our group around connection. Um, so I invite those of you on screen just to play a little bit with me, can you connect your hand to your head? Great, and find a different way to connect your hand to your head. Very nice, and how about your hand to your heart? And elbow to elbow, good. And hand to your ear, can you find a different way to connect to your hand to your ear? Good, and can you connect your hand to somebody else's hand on screen here? We try to at least <laughs> reach out and connect. Woo! <laughs> how about your elbow to somebody else? All right, and how about a foot? Oh, oh all right, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't think I'd see all your feet today. Great, thank you. So just playing with connection and body shapes to ourselves, to others, something we might do in our groups. Um, so moving now into a little self-reflection, I'll just ask, 
one of you to share, normally we'd ask everybody, um, what's one way you connect to yourself right now? What's one helpful way you connect to yourself? Anybody want to share? Oh, absolutely. Um, to me, yeah. it's, it's meditation and mindfulness for sure. I have a daily practice. So I try to start my day by having that connection. Great. So med meditation and mindfulness and starting your day with that, Scott, creates connection to you. Great. Thank you. So if there were more time, we would go around with our whole group and, and everybody might share a way you connect to yourself. And in that way, we're, we're promoting connection to ourselves and to others, hearing what others do in their lives. Um, so you, using a game, but then taking the game to kind of open a door where we can share about ourselves as much or as little as we feel comfortable doing. So there's always that agency to choose to share or not to share or how much. So there's our example and, and, and uh, thank you. We'll close our segment on connection there. And I'll jump in with emotional uh, awareness and expression. This is another really um, significant building block uh, that we will tiptoe in today very lightly. Um, emotional awareness is the ability to make sense of your own emotions and that of others. This is known as emotional intelligence. And the benefits of emotional awareness is the ability to communicate emotions to others and to understand others better. And as an actor, this is really essential because you want to be able to express what the character is feeling and what they're going to, and maybe even able to empathize with that character, even if you're playing a villain. So emotional awareness and expression is also helpful in learning how to navigate the difficulties of life and to create and express personal boundaries, whether you're on stage or you're working in a prison or just navigating your everyday life. Now, working with emotions is progressive work, especially with the incarceral population. Um, it's particularly important that we have to be conscious of not opening up something too fast or too sensitive that we don't want to reawaken perhaps trauma that might exist in the group among individuals. So it takes the facilitator um, uh, like a drama therapist to be aware of reading the room, as Lynn said earlier, taking the temperature, go slowly, check in, make sure that everyone is moving along at the same pace. And there's a technique we use in drama therapy called distancing, we call it therapeutic distancing. So sometimes we start far away, that's why we use the Shakespeare plays, and then we come in a lot closer when we have personal connections or maybe even our personal writings that we perform later on. Um, so the way we would work with emotions would be to start with the primary ones, such as mad, sad, glad, scared, and do a fun warm up like we did earlier in the segment, right? Um, something that people can access easily and feel like it's a win. And in drama therapy, we like to have these um, progressions of like, oh, I could do that. That's not too uh, far out of my wheelhouse. And oh, I can do this. And so you progress along easily. Um, and one of the nice things about working um, sequentially year after year is that we have a mentorship that happens with the seasoned actors. They often go first and demonstrate for the others who might feel like, hey, what are you doing? I don't want to look like some fool, you know? And then they watch these guys, like you just saw Julian's clip, who have... Um, the joy of expression and saying it's okay to act foolish. It's okay to act vulnerable. Um, so one of the ways we um, express this is through sculpting. And sculpting is a technique that um, creates images and shapes with our bodies to express abstract concepts, such as your feelings, for example. Um, and this builds skills of self-awareness also self-regulation and making conscious choices that are positive rather than reactive. Um, the next level would be complex emotions. And this can be addressed further in the group process, such as when we're in rehearsal or we're blocking a play. Um, and it might be a good time where the director might say, hey, what do you think the character is thinking at this moment? Or what is motivating them? Or what are the obstacles? And an, um, an actor can learn how to draw parallels to their own life experience through the character. 
So for example, um, <clears throat> I'm thinking of uh, Proteus uh, in Two Gentlemen of Verona. <clears throat> he has a soliloquy <clears throat> and Proteus is struggling with this girl that he has back home that he's totally madly in love with. But then he goes visits his friend Valentine over um, in another city and Valentine's got a new girlfriend and she's pretty hot. So Proteus is like, oh, wow, do I ditch my old girlfriend and do I go after the new one? Oh, but that's gonna make it difficult with my best friend, won't it? Hmm, what do I do here? And he struggles with this and he shows how he's pulled in these different directions with these complex emotions with the audience. And what happens in the end is he follows his lust, which really makes the play interesting. Another one is King Lear, which I'll show you a clip um, of in a minute. And um, there's a character named Gloucester who works really closely with King Lear. And he has two sons. Edgar is his son that everyone knows about. And Edmund is his illegitimate son that he had with some other lady. Mm -hmm. Well, Edmund shows up and says, you know what? I'm tired of being second fiddle. I pretend to the world that Edgar, my brother here, and I are really tight and we're really close together. But the reality is I'm sick of not being recognized as a true son because you know what? I am his son. And so um, in this clip, we will see how he goes through his emotional journey. All right, thanks. Oh, my goddess. To thy laws, my services are bound. Wherefore should I stand in the plague of customs and permit the curiosity of nations to deprive me? For that I am some twelve or fourteen moonshines lag of a brother? Why, bastard? Wherefore base, when my dimensions are as well compact? My mind is generous and my shape is true, as honest madam's issue. Why brand they us with base? With baseness. Bastardy, base, base. Who in the lusty stealth of nature take more composition in fierce quality than dark within a dual stale tidy bed, go to the grave a tribe of fox, got to a sleep and awake? Well, legitimate Edgar, I must have your land. All father's love is to the bastard Edmund as to the legitimate. Fine word. Legitimate. Well, my legitimate, if this letter speed and, and my invention thrive, then Edmund the base shall top the legitimate. I grow, I prosper. Now, God, stand up for bastards. So now you can see a little bit what it looks like once the actor has really worked through all the material, written his backstory. It's absolutely beautiful work. And um, for this particular actor, I know really made him have to look inside and um, uh, develop and grow. Uh, really quickly, there's another story of a fellow who um, had a personal obstacle. He had to play Cassius in um, Othello. And uh, this fellow one evening gets really, really drunk and Othello ends up firing him because he makes a complete fool of himself. And um, he's absolutely mortified the next day. He's like, I can't believe I drank so much. I can't believe I did this. And the actor playing him um, was this young fellow named Ray Ray, who had actually been incarcerated before he'd ever had the opportunity to get drunk in real life. So he didn't have any personal experience with this. And he had to work with the guys in um, the class to figure out how does it, how is it to be drunk? Some of the guys are like, yeah, maybe we'll set you up. And he's like, no, no, no. I want to remain pure, but he had to access this for himself um, in an as if form. And um, he was able to do a great job as well. Okay, so I would like to end this segment with a quick little um, demo about um, contrasting emotions and how sometimes we can get pulled that way. And this is a technique called playback theater. And the way this works is we have um, someone who sort of directs or conducts um, someone who we invite from the audience to tell us quick story. And this will be the teller. And I'm going to invite um, Lynn today to tell a story if you're comfortable doing that. And Raya and I will be the actors playing it back. Um, and we will demonstrate for her her story in a, there's so many different ways of doing it, but for this little space here, our stage today, we will just do quick little um, 
playback for her. We will just sort of say some things and show some things until we get it right for her. And um, there's something about the witnessing, having your story be witnessed and presented to others that can be really healing. So, all right. Hi, Lynn. Um, we would love to hear a story that you have that shows um, conflicting emotions about a situation that you are willing to share today with the group. Sure, 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 sure. Um, I would say this idea of wanting to say something, stand up for myself, be clear, but knowing that it can open a can of worms and not uh, ready to deal with that. So on, on one hand, this wanting to, to, to confront in a sense and, and get my words out and the other knowing that it's not going to do any good and it's just going to potentially create a mess. So that's my, my conflict. Okay. That sounds great. And um, would there be a sentence or some, a summary of how you could, a nugget for each one of those, how you would... mm. nugget. Um, yeah, you should definitely like, yeah, you should always say exactly what's on your mind at all times. Um, <laughs> uh, the nugget, the, the contrast would be, um, yeah, but why stir up the pot? Why? Just, you know, take a more peaceful uh, approach. All right. That sounds great. So, um, Soraya, do you feel called or pulled towards doing one or the other? Uh, I can do the say what's on my mind part. And then I'll do the one that I bother during the pot. All right, let's go. Let's play. I need to share this. This, uh, yeah, I'm going to do it. This, uh, yeah, it is time to be authentic. This is hard, but I, I got to do it. I'm going to do it. <laughs> yes. I, 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 I'm not going to say anything. Um, why, why, you know, why, why stir the pot? You know, why step on the hornet's nest? Why create problems? I'm just going to, I'm just going to stay quiet. Time to stir the pot. Don't stay quiet. No, 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 no. Stop, stop, Open stop. Open that hornet's nest. Stop stirring. Oh, stirring the pot. <laughs> yes. How was that, Lynn? That was perfect. That's exactly what's going on inside. <laughs> All right. We got a little flavor of what playback theory it is. Um, thank you. So now we're going to move on to empathy. Uh, well, let me lead you in. Now, uh, can you tell me how empathy is an important aspect of this work for the actors? Absolutely. Well, we know that um, working with our feelings um, is so important. And, and empathy is like perspective taking, right? Feeling with other people. And as we're creating these groups and we're really trying to build a, a culture of empathy, of learning how to step into someone else's shoes and essentially like figure out how those, uh, it's important in relationships and the connections. Um, and of course we're doing this all the time as actors, right? Trying to figure out why someone feels this way, why are they saying this? And, and then but taking it the next step of um, really creating those pathways to empathy. And one reason I think this is so important in the population that we're working with, which we're all working with, is um, the trauma that so many have experienced. You know, we know that with this research of trauma that our emotions are, are shut down, right? Like our, especially our natural emotions. So we cut down on like the ability to feel our own emotions, like let alone someone else's. So it's a, it's a vital element of you know, with the connection and this emotional awareness to learn how to then be comfortable with our own emotions and then to be able to be comfortable with someone else's emotions and learn that ability to step in. And I really do truly think that it's, it can be learned. I mean, some people have empathy <laughs> from day one, you know, you see that with kids, but with trauma knowing that that, that means it's just shut off, that um, it's something that needs to be developed. Um, and one thing that I like about uh, something that Deepak Chopra has said about empathy and compassion, that they are close cousins, 
you know, if you will, and he says that um, empathy is the visceral feelings, what another feels. So it's really is that stepping in, right, and figuring it out. Um, and I think the connections that we make with the storytelling and with you know, utilizing Shakespeare um, is also illustrated with um, something that Joseph Campbell has pointed out, um, his quotes of, through empathy, we find our own story. And then we are on the path to becoming the hero or heroine of our own story. And I think that that closely ties into our philosophy of saying that, you know, Shakespeare can be that opening, that portal, right, that brings us into this this shared quest, if you will. So one example um, is one of our participants, uh, Joey Pagadwin at uh, Solano State Prison that we worked with him on Hamlet as well. So kind of serendipitous again that Hamlet is, is pulling in here. Um, it, I believe it was the third play that he did with us. And it was really beautiful to see him grow as an actor. Of course, that's always a great byproduct of all this, right? But then to see him, uh, to witness him, like connect with his emotional awareness and, and his emotional side, the humanity of himself. And he shares that in a great interview. I'm going to do a shout out to Uncuffed. It's the podcast that takes place inside Solano. It's been on hiatus, of course, since um, COVID, but check out Uncuffed because there is one particular um, interview he does. And I'll just quote a moment here of him. He, what he said was participating in the Shakespeare strengthened my emotional vocabulary to be able to put words to my feelings, to speak about my emotions, describe the way I feel and to share that in a group and then to help each other. And I think that's also this a, a beautiful explanation of how we are creating this culture of empathy so they can support each other, right? Because we aren't there all the time, and but then they develop this connection to be able to help each other through some of the times or how to like, develop these feelings? How do they be okay with someone else's feelings in the room? Um, so I think that's a, a lovely way that he put that. And we were so lucky to have a crew come in from CNN and from the big story and do a piece called The Bard Behind Bars. And I'm going to show a clip here and you'll see also our one of our fearless leaders, Leslie Courier, being interviewed here. We're creating empathy at all times, right? There. That's one of our goals. We're constantly working on that. And we don't actually use the word. I don't personally use the word. Like, here we are, creating empathy. But knowing that that's like part of the process of getting in touch with our feelings. And that idea of, you know, research pointing out that the mirror neurons is, is what's happening when we're creating empathy. And um, one way to do that is by creating those mirrors and that witnessing a little bit of what we experienced earlier in the playback and something that I think as you know teaching artists practitioners inside we're all doing some of the mirror work right like being that model but also probably a lot of us have done the mirror exercise as a group and then you know what on pairs of having us near each other you know the whatever pantomime or emotions and expressions but but this is um, something I'd like to take a moment to, to share with you. One that I think takes it just a little bit further is how we can um, connect with our emotions. And, and Scott, are you willing to do a little, uh, a little piece here with us? Of course. OK, great, great, great. Um, so this is, I'll ask uh, either Marianne or, or, uh, or Soraya, who's ever up for doing this with Scott. And you will be in a mirror. So I will ask. Um, Sorry, Mary, I can't actually see everyone. So Marianne. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, great. So you'll be A, Scott will be B. So how this will work is um, I'm gonna give you some very basic emotions to start with uh, being you know, the director of this moment and working on opposing emotions. And so I'm gonna ask Marianne to take a pose of the emotion of happy. Happy? Happy. We'll start with some basic ones of happy. Yeah, so that's her pose for happy. And so and then I would ask Scott, which will be B, you'll be the mirror, to mirror that for her for just a moment to, to see if you can you know, observe all of the details of what she's doing right now and see if you can create that. Okay. okay. Um, so what we'll ask Marianne to do is to, in slow motion, going from, like as slow as you possibly can, going from this emotion of happy 
and going toward sad to see if we can find that extreme of the each like frame by frame. So as if I was to watch in, walk in and see this statue, I wouldn't necessarily notice it was moving. It's going in such slow motion. And Scott, as the mirror, you're observing right now. You're witnessing what she's going through, this process, this, this slow, potentially maybe 60 seconds process of going from one extreme to the next. As we observe this slow motion process, she's using every element of her body, facial expressions. And she finds a ending pose, lovely. And then Scott, who's observed this, is going to see if he can recreate that same process, that slow motion, frame by frame, of going from that extreme, from happy. So see if you can remember that beginning pose that she had. Yeah. And see if you can recreate, and she'll witness that same slow motion. From that, that was beautiful. See if we will, before we shake this off, because we're going to go from that same moment and now Scott will lead it. So Scott will go through for him, whatever he needs to think about to access, to go from that same moment of sad back to his version, whatever his journey will be, back to his version of happy. So that will always end on the positive, right? Um, but to take that journey, if you will, the same slow motion. Okay, so, but not back to Mary Ann's original position to my own happy. Yes, you get to lead this. This okay. is your version. Yeah, and Mary Ann is observing. So she will witness and then recreate it for you. Okay. Thank you, and Marianne will now mirror that. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it was so like hard not to follow, right? <laughs> Even us as like watching and witnessing of that, just to, to see the, the progression was beautiful. And you can imagine then using this with a big group. Sometimes you know, it can be quite silent, um, but then to add in any kind of elements that need to be to express it, to vocalize it too, can be really beneficial and powerful. And then to add in, um, you have to do this with some other pre-planned um, contrasting emotions can be a beautiful way of, of connecting and finding that empathy. So real quick check-in for, for anyone like Soraya or, or to witness or Marianne or Scott, what that process was like for you, if you have any 
any um, reflections? I, well, for me, it's there's something about the slow motion aspect of it that just makes it more of a journey, and and you actually connect, I think, at a deeper deeper level to the destination as, as you're journeying through. You kind of find it's like your uh, uh, your emotion finds the end point before the actual physical action does. So you see that journey now. It's really interesting. Right. Yeah, for me too, as the observer, it was very poignant. Like I felt my heart just melting and um, just reminds me of the power of the pause and the slowing down um, that we get to do with these theater practices. So yeah, very touching. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. And I would say something, I, don't, I wouldn't wanna like shake off this, this wonderful feeling that you just shared of happiness. Um, but someone else might have a harder time with the fact that they had to go to the, to the sad or to any of the emotions that are more intense. So we'll practice a quick like de-rolling, right? There's a couple of different ways we can do it. One is just like maybe a shake out, just like shake all that off. I don't want to hold it. Or maybe you want to hold some of it. I want to hold the heavy, you know, that's fine. Or you can like wipe it off like if it's feeling intense and sticky and, and you know, like really just like allowing it go. And, and I think one thing about the wipe I like is that it's that now you feel a little bit more connected to yourself too and that personal touch like we don't we don't always do that like actually hug yourself or touch yourself and especially if you're thinking of our population inside they don't so allowing them that opportunity can, can be really good beautiful so thank you Lynn a bit about empathy. Yeah. really beautiful so I, I realize we're coming to our home stretch of our time together. So just want to lead a very brief takeaway and also thank you so much to Scott and the Shakespeare in Prisons Network for having this conference, for inviting us. And just a reminder on February 26th at um, 3 p.m. Eastern time, we'll be leading a, a workshop where we'll ground this in Shakespeare and also be engaging you in lots and lots of activities like this. Um, but to close, I wanna invite us each to share briefly like one line, what's one thing that touched you in our time together today and one emotion you're left with? One thing that touched you, touched your heart and one emotion you're left with. And then those of us listening will just make one pose, any pose. So we'll have like three different poses to reflect what, a, any, you know, what each person shared. Um, for example, one thing that touched me today, many things, but it was touch watching um, Joey share about his role of Hamlet and what that did for him in his life. And Luke too. <laughs> um, and um, I'm left with a, a kind of an emotion of tenderness, tenderness. So I'll count down three, two, one, and Marianne, Scott, and Lynn, if you can make a pose to reflect something of what I shared. Three, two, one. Thank you. And um, Marianne, would you like to share next? Yes, um, I want to share that I was touched by Scott's willingness to jump in and participate. We didn't even talk about it ahead of time and your willingness and your commitment really um, touched me. And uh, I want to thank you for that. And I felt connection with all of you in this work. So um, I'll do my own pose, which will be this. Great, and let's all make a pose to embody something that Marianne shared. Three, two, one. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Lynn, would you like to share? I'll go next, yes, absolutely. Um, something that touched me was, um, Ah, just the, ah, the, the beauty of, of all the work that everyone's doing just to like, really, uh, really touches my heart. And uh, I'm feeling, I'm feeling nostalgic. It's been, it's been almost a year, right? I'm going inside and I'm just feeling really nostalgic right now. Hmm. Thank you, Lynn. So invite us to make a pose to represent something of what Lynn just shared. Three, two, one. Thank you. And Scott, would you like to share something that touched your heart and an emotion you're left with? Uh, well, for, for 
all the different um, in the clips to see the the guys, the depth of engagement, um, not only with the text, but in the moment, um, I thought was uh, amazing. So I'm going to say I walk away amazed. And I give I give you something like. <laughs> Great. All right. Here we go. Three, two, one. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much once again for having us, Scott. Um, anything you want to share in closing? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That was. I, thanks for including me. Um, actually, because that was that was just the the best way to kind of like somatically absorb um, some of the lessons that we had today. I'm really looking forward to seeing you all back on Friday, February 26th from three to four, our standard time, which will be more of an active workshop in that live Q&A setting. So, um, so I'm inviting everyone to come and be a part of, of this fun for sure. And I wanna thank you, Marianne. Thank you, Soraya. Thank you, Lynn, for taking the time to just give us this kind of behind the scenes peek into uh, what's happening in incarcerated classrooms and in your classes, your circles that you're that you're creating at 14 different facilities within the state of California, which I believe um, Marin Shakespeare is the largest provider of prison arts programming, um, perhaps in the world. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Nobody fact check me on that. But you gotta be up there. You gotta be up there. Um, so thank you so much for your for your time, your attention, your love. Um, and we'll look forward to seeing you back on February 26th.